Thank you, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for traveling to Rockland uh, this weekday evening. Appreciate your presence. How many folks, this is your first time on Jessup's campus? A couple of folks, well, my Nehemiah folks. <laughs> Welcome. We encourage you to check us out, take a look around, learn a, bit, a little bit about the campus um, and this, this hidden gem here in the Sacramento region. So I'm going to be talking to you today uh, really about something that was birthed out of my dissertation research, uh, which is about building inclusive environments for all students. So as Tim said, my name is Aisha Lowe, uh, very excited to be here at William Jessup University, um, serve as professor of education uh, within our School of Education and teach our MAT students. We have MAT students in the house. Hello, hello. Uh, also have the pleasure of coordinating research uh, for the School of Education as well as directing the Office of Academic Research for the university. So a couple of hats, as Tim said, uh, that keep me busy but also keep me uh, rewarded um, and always moving full steam ahead. So this lecture series, this lecture series that we launched last spring, we launched really with a specific focus on our most vulnerable populations. Uh, we kicked it off with Dr. Addie Ellis, who talked to us about youth who are experiencing homelessness um, and talking about the realities that those young people face and what that means for us, in particular, who are educators. We then had a wonderful talk with Dr. David Ennis and his work on fatherlessness. Um, and again, what does that mean for our young people? What's going to present in the classroom and in their lives as they are struggling with fatherlessness. And so we're continuing in that theme of this focus on sort of our most vulnerable students and vulnerable populations. Uh, and for me, that is really focused on, in particular, students of color who are also uh, suffering from poverty, and in particular, African American and Latino students. So to set the stage for what we want to do today, really want to engage you in an interactive discussion. I am not going to talk to you for two hours straight. Uh, I will be doing a lot of talking, of course, uh, but we're going to be interactive. So we will have some opportunities for whole group discussion, small group discussion, and even self-reflection. So you do see a little paper in front of you where you'll get to take some of the survey items that I use for my research. So have your pens ready for that. Uh, and really the, the purpose here for me is sort of shifting the conversation about education reform. So I actually have a fairly long history in education reform. I taught at a charter school in San Francisco, taught fifth grade science and social studies as at a, a KIPP school in San Francisco, spent four years doing educational research for the California Charter Schools Association, which was all about, you know, that movement to provide choice for families, and then spent two years once I moved to Sacramento sort of doing education reform policy work and advocacy work. And there's a lot of talk in our nation about education reform and the state of education. And having been in it, and now come out of it, uh, my reflection has really been that we're missing the point. Right? We can look over the history of education and we can look over numerous reforms that have taken place over decades. And we will see that we're sort of tinkering around the edges. We have not had this massive overhaul of the system as reformers would desire. We have not seen a uh, great improvement in student outcomes. And what I want to present is sort of a shift in the dialogue, that we're focusing in the wrong places and that we need to focus in on the students themselves. Goal then is that you would be better informed at the very least. And for some of you, in particular those who are educators, that you would be equipped to be that change agent, to be that that additional missing piece for the young people that you're going to serve. So that is our plan for today. I want to start us out with this brief video that just gives a bit of context about what is happening in education in the US right now. And when we talk about, and when we hear others talk about, you know, the, the collapse of American education or the underperformance right now in American education, just some numbers, some statistics that will help set that context of what that discussion is all about. There was background music, hold on.
All right, so as we look at those percentages, um, and that's sort of our, our most recent nation's befo report before we switched over to Common Core and now need to recalibrate the entire system, but we're seeing that as a nation, uh, less than 50% of our students are pr proficient in these very core skills, right? These basic skills of reading and math. Now, if we were to look at those numbers for our students of color, we would then see even smaller percentages. Uh, so we know, and we've probably all heard of this term, the achievement gap, and in particular, the racial achievement gap, as well as the socioeconomic achievement gap that we see between different groups of students. And so that really was the focus of my research. Um, having spent plenty of time as a social sciences, majoring in psychology and sociology, and then getting my doctorate in education, reading so much about these gaps right, this persistent underperformance that we see by race, and being very interested in that, being very compelled by that, but really looking for solutions. Well, what do we do about that, right? How do we actually close this gap? Uh, how do we get to a place where all students are operating and performing at the same levels? And so really looking at what we call within the ed psych this overprediction phenomenon. Uh, do we have any folks who actually like statistics in the room? Couple of hands, bless you, that's wonderful. Right, so we know within statistics, when we look at probability, that what we should see are no differences between groups, right? We should see groups performing at equal levels. But when we see a particular group that's overrepresented and underperforming, that's what we mean by this overprediction phenomenon, right? We're seeing more students of color underperforming than would be expected. And we know that that has a long history, and we'll touch on that just a little bit tonight. Uh, but what's been really interesting in the ed psych research is the, a number of different studies that have been done to look at that issue and sort of address some of the assumptions or beliefs that have existed over history. Typically deficit models, right? This notion that, okay, where there's something deficient about these students or their environment. So we could go way back to uh, previous times in history where there was literally a model of deficit intelligence. Oh, well, those kids just aren't as smart, right? But we know over time, having done research and assessed students, that that's definitely not the case, that we see uh, across all people, right, sort of that bell curve of performance. People land in different places. Most people are right in the middle. Uh, but then you have these deficit ideas around culture. What well, must be something about the culture of those children, that they simply don't value education. So educational psychologists come along, they conduct research to uh, go into communities to ask those students and those parents, what are your aspirations? What would you like to be in the future? And what they found, to the shock of many, were very high educational and career aspirations. Uh, those students of color, including low-income students of color, wanted to go to college like everyone else. And they wanted to be doctors and lawyers and teachers and dentists like everyone else. And those parents wanted those things for them as well. Uh, so they were saying, okay, there's, there's not a lack of aspiration here. Maybe it's about economics, right? So then we sort of shifted to this discourse around the culture of poverty. Uh, that it's about the lack of resources that students have uh, if they are suffering from poverty. But then we have research that shows us that even if you take African American and Caucasian students of the same economic level, you still see these racial disparities in performance. And so that's really where the work that I got involved in and became interested in came into play, where social psychologists begin to ask the question of, well, what is happening internally with these students? We've been so focused on the external and context and the way that the environment might be impacting them, let's focus a bit inward and understand what might be going on in the hearts and minds of these students, how might they be impacted by the environment, but in a more internal social psychological way that's impacting their performance. And that's really um, the research that, that I started to do. So when we think about these students, right, and in particular I'm focusing on African-American Latino students who are also suffering from poverty, right? The combination of the two. Because the two are not synonymous, right? We're wise enough to know that. We, we do have an entire population of African-American and Latino families that are middle class and that are upper class that aren't dealing with these issues. Uh, but in particular, looking at our students of color who are suffering from poverty and thinking about, well, what is going on in the hearts and minds of these young people? And what does that mean for education? 
What does it mean to perform well academically if I'm struggling with poverty and trauma and neglect or abuse, right? What does that mean for me once I come into the classroom when I'm coming with all this baggage that our standards are not set up to address? And so when I, when I think about these kids, honestly, I think about myself. Uh, because when I think about these young people, I know that I was one of those young people, right? I was one of those young people, a young African-American girl growing up in San Francisco, California, struggling with poverty and trauma and the ways in which I interacted with the educational system. So little Aisha, <laughs> I know, she's so cute. <laughs> Little Aisha there, I don't know how many months old I was, um, but little Aisha, like all children, was born with all the hope and potential in the world, right? And um, I can attest to the research that has found those high desires for education and for success. Um, even though, you know, I was born into a low-income family, I had education drummed into my head from day one. My mother, my grandparents, was constant. You are going to college, you're going to be successful, that's the ticket. That's going to make the difference for your life. And so I had that aspiration at a very young age. But at the same time, you're dealing with the realities of your environment. You're dealing with the realities of lack. You're dealing with the realities of trauma and things that happen in your life that are outside of your control and have an impact on you. So little Aisha is probably about 15 in that picture, I think. So by the time I'm 15, little Aisha has endured the trauma of a rape at the age of 11. She has endured the trauma of pregnancy at the age of 13. At the age of 15, Aisha has lost her mind. My mother can attest it to you. <laughs> Aisha has lost her mind because Aisha has sort of just gotten caught up in this notion of valuelessness, right? I don't have value, right? You face situations in life that tell you that you don't have value, and then you take that on for yourself. So at this point as a teenager, I'm making very, very bad decisions. I mean, I'm running away from home, uh, giving my mother gray hairs, uh, heading in a direction where literally my family was just hoping and praying I would graduate from high school. Right, that's the goal at this point. Can we get the girl through high school alive and well? Right, that's the hope. So we fast forward and little Aisha becomes Dr. Aisha and she has three degrees from Stanford University. How does that happen? Right? Thank you, thank you. Right, but how do we go, how do we go from that to that? And for me, I mean, first and foremost, I'm a woman of faith because my mother was praying, right? <laughs> praying that I would make it. But it's because I had the opportunity to be in educational environments where they communicated unconditional acceptance and belonging. I had the opportunity because my mother despite being a single parent worked very hard to keep me in private school so that I was not lost in a public school in San Francisco. And I had this great opportunity to have wonderful educational experiences with this educators who despite the fact that I was running away from home, I always ran away with my books, right? Despite the fact that I was running away from home and you know, making these bad decisions that were gonna potentially you know, derail my future, these educators who were communicating to me high expectations and acceptance, and you belong here. Right? You are intelligent, you are capable, you can be successful. And that really carried me through, right? Despite those difficult teenage years, it really did carry me through and, and get me over the hump. I did stop acting crazy at about junior year. About junior year, yes. My mom's, hi mom, everybody say hi to my mom. <laughs> That's my momsy. Everyone should give her a, a rose or a, a dollar or something. She prayed me through, she prayed me through, right? So that's really became the focus for me was, okay, how do we do that for all the other Aishas, right? How do we have school environments uh, that will communicate that acceptance and belonging and those high expectations and really push them to their full potential? And in particular, how do we do that in our public schools? I wasn't in public schools, right? I was in private schools. It's unfortunate to say, but I don't think this would have been my outcome had I gone to public schools in San Francisco. I don't think I would be here right now. But the majority of our children are in public schools, right? So those have to be places 
that are communicating these very core psychological needs so that our students can, can be their best selves. So for me, this is very psychological in nature. You know, psychology was my first, the first discipline I fell in love with. Um, ultimately studied educational psychology as a combination. And for me, this, this, this notion of what students really need, right, the core of what I feel like we're really missing in ed reform is really connected to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. How many of us are familiar with Maslow? Wonderful. Then I won't spend a lot of time on it. Right, so we know I'll just fill it out, within Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that he has right, laid out this theory that as human beings, we all have these core needs and that we have to meet them in this order. Right? That initially a person is going to seek to fulfill their physiological needs. Once those are met, then they can focus on their safety needs then love and belongingness, then esteem, then self-actualization. And he believed as a theorist that they had to go in this order, right? So for example, if a child is coming to school hungry, if a child has come to school and they are tired because they live in a situation where they can't get a good night's rest, then Maslow would explain to us, explain to us as educators, never mind uh, what your pedagogy is or the curriculum, that need has to be met first, right? They can't begin to interact with you on content when they are missing these core needs. Or safety, love and belongingness. If they've been neglected by family, that's going to impact them. Esteem from first for themselves as well as from others. And then self-actualization. Now, Maslow believed that most people would never reach that. We could argue with him on that and say whether or not we agree, but he believed that most of us would not self-actualize, that we would not fulfill our full potential or become our best selves. But the focus for me here is really love and belonging, because I believe that is the core divide between where our students are and where we're trying to get them to. Now, when we talk in particular about students suffering from poverty, we've done a better job, that we could continue to do a, a, an even better job, on really focusing in on those physiological needs, those safety needs, right? We keyed into that at some point as a system and then we launched national school lunch programs and even breakfast programs so that we could feed children who might not you know, have the financial wherewithal to eat well at home. Uh, we started after school programs, right? Let's keep them until five, six o'clock when their parents are actually off from work so that we can increase some safety there for them. But we haven't really keyed in to this next level around love and belonging. What does that mean? What does that look like in a classroom and in a school? What does it mean for us to meet that need for students? Now, we're very keyed into esteem good grades, high test scores, getting degrees, but we wanna notice here, even in this very foundational psychological theory that Maslow put forth, you can't get to esteem if you haven't gotten your love and belonging needs met yet, right? So I think that's the core sort of missing element uh, of what we're doing right now in education. And we'll talk more about it. We'll talk a little bit about what I found in my research and we can talk about whether or not you agree. All right, so with that, for me, I'm really looking at this intersection between identity and perception and the environment. So we all know, any of us who have a social psychological background, you know that we, we understand conceptually that we all have many selves, right? I am a woman. That is one of my identities, right? I am African American, that is one of my identities. I am a Christian, that is one of my identities. And we could go on and on. If you ever played sports, there's a whole culture around that. And you might have an identity as an athlete. If you're a gamer, right? There's a whole culture around that. And that might be an identity for you. So we know that we have multiple identities. But the notion here is that those identities are being sort of constantly framed by your perception of yourself as well as your perception of the environment that you're in. And it's sort of cyclical, right? They're acting on each other and influencing each other. And again, what I'm arguing is that students need to know that their full self, everything they're bringing to the table is accepted and that they have a sense of belonging for all of those identities, and in particular for our students of color, their racial identity, right? There needs to be an explicit understanding that in this place, in this schoolhouse, in this classroom, who I am, 
as an African-American student, a Latino student, a Caucasian student, right? Let's talk about that because we, we treat our Caucasian brothers and sisters like they have no race, right? <laughs> our, our Caucasian students, all right, my, the, my Asian self, whoever I am, I need to know that as my teacher, that as my principal, that in this place, that you see me fully and that all of that is acceptable and good and belongs here in this place. Now, of course, the big thing is gonna be how do we do that? And we're gonna have a discussion about that when we get to the end. So let's do a bit of a table discussion with your table mates there. Um, and really just talking about this concept of acceptance and belonging, because I believe we have all experienced it, I hope, at least once, right, in our lives, that there was some environment or some person that came along and really gave us this sense of acceptance and belonging. So let's take a few minutes, talk with your table there. How have you benefited from an environment or a person that provided you a sense of acceptance and belonging? And just talk about what that felt like and the benefit you feel you got from that, whether it was educational, family, work, wherever it may have been. So let's take a few minutes and talk with those uh, next to you.
All right, everyone, I hate to cut these conversations short, uh, but let's hear a little report out. Any group want to, or any one want to share? A time when an environment or a person really communicated acceptance and belonging. And what was the impact that had on you? Now, I know a lot of you, I might just call names. So the way it frees you up, right, to be your best self. That's awesome. Others. Tessa. Right, and then that carried you through, right? So that one teacher gave enough confidence that it could carry her through to, to the next situation. Any others? Nehemiah folks, we do this all the time. Karen. So now you guys are already coming up with great themes, right? Individualization, knowing you personally, connecting with you, finding out what your strengths are and pulling out those strengths, communicating to you ability, right? These are all the themes of how we tap into this, this love and belonging. Anyone else want to share? Yes, Juana. I don't think we can say enough about what it means for a child for someone to believe in them. And it seems simple. It seems like, well, we know that. But it's amazing how much that is not happening in the classroom, 
right, on a regular basis. And it was the exact same thing for me, you know. The, I went to this school called Fellowship Academy. It was a small, private Christian school in San Francisco, and they literally just sort of loved me into my full potential, and it was an amazing experience. Right, so when we talk about these core needs, you know, and if we went around, I know everyone has a story of someone or some place where you just felt like you were okay, right? Someone came along and said, hey, you're okay, right? You're okay and you're good and you have things to contribute and what that did for you internally. When we talk about that for our students of color in particular, we, we wanna understand that that need is core, I believe. It's core to human beings, as Maslow said, it's something all of our students need. But I want to emphasize that it's particularly important for our students of color because there is this history, right? So in particular, when we look at our African-American students or even our Latino students, our Native American students, there's this history, right, of the way they've been viewed or treated within the nation that even if they didn't have those experiences, that is still coloring their perception of themselves and coloring their perceptions of what it means for them to be an academic and for them to be a scholar or for them to engage in an arena where stereotypes typically they're not supposed to engage or they're not supposed to do well. So we do want to understand that our students of color are contending with legacy, right? It's a legacy we have all inherited. None of us were there, right? But we've inherited this special gift called race relations in America, right? And it's still having an impact on us in our interactions uh, for years, many, many years later. So we want to understand the reality of that and just face it head on, right? It's, it's such a thing in our country. Uh, well, I don't know why we have such a hard time just dealing with it. It happened, right? It's none of our faults, we weren't there, but it happened. So we need to face the reality head on of what is that legacy of the history of race relations within America and what might that mean for our students and how do we change the dialogue around that, right? How do we finally pull down those barriers and get to a place where we're really just loving on people uh, for who they are as people? So we have to acknowledge that, sort of the historical and cultural significance of race, the things that took place in the past, the deficit, uh, and deficiency models that have been passed on to us and just wrestle and grapple with that. We also, have to, we also need to get into this issue of implicit bias. So all of these areas have literally tons, decades of research on them. We cannot get into all the research. We would be here all night. But there's this area of implicit bias, which is a very important research area that I encourage you to dig into deeper. Because in particular today, uh, what we often talk about when we're talking about issues of race uh, in our country is much more implicit than it is explicit. Right now, unfortunately, we've seen many more incidences of explicit uh, racism in recent years. But we're often within the educational uh, context talking about implicit Right? These unspoken messages, these unspoken tendencies or ways of being that are impacting students in ways that we might not even realize. Uh, there's actually a really cool test you can take online that sort of tells you what your implicit biases are. It's shocking. You should take it. It's hilarious. Um, you'll, you'll be arguing with the results. I'm like, I am not. Uh, but the, <laughs> the results said, yes, you are. <laughs> there's something there. <laughs> Right? So we have to understand that race is sort of this social psychological entity, right? It's present. It's seamless, right? It's like, it's like a, a gas in the room that has no, no, no odor, it has uh, no sort of tangible touch to it, but it's present and it's impacting us. And so as educators in particular, we have to be aware that we likely have implicit biases. It's just the reality of life. I have them, we all have them. But we need to recognize that, know what they are so that we can confront them. And there's actually research that talks about how you confront those implicit biases, right? It talks about how, you know, if I take the test and I find out that I have some bias against athletes, right? That every time I have an athlete in, in my classroom, there's this sort of implicit notion of, oh, you know, there goes another dumb jock, right? We'd never say it out our mouths, but it may be there. But what the research is gonna tell me is, okay, well then those are the students I specifically need to spend more time with, getting to know them and connecting with them because as I connect with the person as a person, it'll help me to overcome those biases. Again, there's a lot of research there and that's another place to look. And then we also want to keep in mind when we're dealing with our students of color, this notion of social identity threat. Because there's been a lot of research that has found in particular with African-American students that within the academic domain, 
our students are often experiencing this social identity threat. Right? They have this identity, their racial self, that is stereotyped as not being accepted within the academic domain, as not belonging within the academic domain. And so therefore, every time they're in the academic domain, that identity is threatened. And I'll talk to you a bit more right now about stereotype threat, which was really the focus of my research. We won't really get into these other issues around how stereotype threat can then lead to cognitive dissonance and then ultimately cause a child to disidentify with school. Uh, we can talk more about that later offline if you'd like to get a little deeper. Uh, but stereotype threat is this amazing psychological uh, theory. It was at the time when I was under, in undergrad being tested. Uh, so I've got to see a theory go from just being a theory that everyone was arguing about and testing to becoming something that today, if you take an introduction to psychology class, this will be in your textbook, uh, right? It wasn't in mine because they were researching at the time, but now it would be. And so this is really groundbreaking work that folks like Claude Steele were doing out of Stanford University. I happened to be there when he was there, which was great. He was my honors thesis um, uh, advisor. I got to work with Claude Steele while they were framing this idea. And it really is this notion that if you have an identity, any identity, about which there is a known stereotype, that whenever you are in a situation where that stereotype could be confirmed, it creates a very subconscious anxiety for you that then depresses your performance. So here's how they stumbled on this. Claude Steele, uh, like so many researchers, was very interested in the achievement gap and what is going on, why is it persisting, despite all of the advances we've had as a nation. And so what they sought out to do from a very psychological perspective is try to understand, well, what might be happening internally with students of color that might be leading to this achievement gap. So here's the experiment they did. They took undergraduates at Stanford University, right? These are all intelligent young people. They've gotten into an amazing university. Uh, so in a sense, it's sort of a level playing field in a sense. And so they took both African American and Caucasian undergraduates at Stanford. And in their regular control condition, they gave those students the verbal portion of the GRE. Right, this, if you don't know, this is one of the tests you take to get into grad school. And what they saw in the normal control condition is that the African American students did not perform as well as the Caucasian students. Now, in their experimental condition, you have another group of undergraduates at Stanford, African American and Caucasian, but this time, as we often do in psychology, there's a bit of deception uh, within the experiment. So they tell the students, we are not assessing your verbal ability. This is a new version of the GRE. You're testing the test, we're not testing you. So we want you to take it and then we're gonna ask you questions about any of the items that didn't make sense. You're gonna give us feedback on the test because we're calibrating a new version of the GRE. So they took away the idea in the students' minds that they were personally gonna be evaluated. That one change in their protocol and they saw racial differences in performance disappear. All of a sudden, the African-American students were performing as well as their Caucasian counterparts. So as we always do in research, of course, people see the results and there's infighting and argumentation. Uh, we don't know if your methodology was sound, but over time, they replicate this study in numerous different ways. In some studies, they vary whether or not they had the students write their race, right? So they gave them the test with no racial identification. They gave them a version of the test where they had to write their race, and they found that when they simply didn't write their race, they saw the differences in performance disappear. So over literally a decade, psychologists all across the nation pick up on this. They're doing experiments in different ways to test it out in different ways, and they're seeing the same result over and over and over again. So it's now considered an established psychological phenomenon. And I think this quote by Claude Steele sums it up well, what stereotype threat is. He says, when a negative stereotype about a group that one is part of becomes personally relevant, usually as an interpretation of one's behavior or an experience one is having, stereotype threat is the resulting sense that one can then be judged or treated in terms of the stereotype or that one might do something that would inadvertently confirm it. An implication of this definition is that stereotype threat, stereotypes excuse me, can affect their targets even before they have translated into behavior or judgments. The mere threat of discrimination 
and devaluation implied by the perceived relevance of a negative group stereotype, like the threat of a snake loose in the house can have effects of its own. Right, so this very sort of psychological predicament of race that is impacting students in ways that they were very unconscious of. Because in all of these experiments, they would always ask the participants in the debrief, were you thinking about race? Were you worried about being discriminated against? Did, you, did, did any of these stereotypes come to mind? And consciously, participants always said, no, no, of course, I wasn't thinking about that. So it's very subtle, very uh, psychological in nature. So they've gone on to see the same results uh, with the stereotype of women being less able in math and science. They've got the very same results. They went as far as doing experiments with the elderly about the stereotype that they're forgetful. Um, you know, I, I don't use this one as often because I think it's offensive, but they went on to do it you know, with blondes and stereotypes that exist there, right? They have literally, any known stereotype they conduct these experiments and they see the same thing time and time again. That you would see this natural underperformance when the stereotype is triggered. And if you can in some way alleviate the thought that you might be judged by this stereotype in this moment, you see all of a sudden people's performance rise to equal levels. Right, so with that, uh, definitely groundbreaking. But the question for me became, as a young undergraduate and even in grad school, that's great, but what are we gonna do with that? Right? We can't lie to students every time they take a test. Right? We, can't, we can't fill our classrooms with deception and, and have them to believe that this is not actually a performance activity. It is, we are evaluating them all the time. And so when I got into the literature, I was really trying to figure out, well, what could we do about this? How might we change this? And it led me to really four core areas that I was interested in seeing, might these be potential solutions to the stereotype threat effect? And I really conceive of these now as sort of perceptions and identities that again, students bring into the classroom and the ways in which those are impacting their performance and their outcomes. So one is called theory of intelligence uh, or the perception students have of their own intelligence. So what do I believe about my own intelligence and how does that impact those stereotype threat perceptions? School culture, what are my perceptions of the learning environment? and what might Im impact that might have. Uh, what's called academic goal orientations. So when I'm in the classroom, when I'm at school, what are my perceptions of the purpose of education? What is my goal when I'm sitting in the classroom as a student? And then lastly, racial identity. Both students' perceptions of themselves racially as well as the way they think others perceive their racial selves. And so we'll go through each one of these briefly. As we're going through them, you have on the table in front of you a couple of survey items, not all of them, because the survey I used was much longer than this. But we're gonna, I'm gonna have you take a few of them as we go through and sort of self-reflect on, on, on these questions. All right, so this research, when I did it, was survey research. I collected uh, 280 surveys, used 131 of them because I was focusing specifically on African-American and Latino students, but I had a bunch of other data there that I should probably do something with someday. Um, <laughs> I was done in the Bay Area, two large comprehensive urban high schools in the Bay Area. You see the breakdown there for 10th and 11th graders, male and female across different classrooms. All right, so let's start with theory of intelligence. So all of these are areas where we could go into the library, we could get into the literature for months. Right? These are literally areas that have been researched for decades. The key addition for me was, what does this mean for students of color, right? Because the research was not typically done with students of color. And so we learned, we've learned a lot about all of these areas for students in general, but I was in particular interested in what relationship might these things have with race for students of color, and could these be tools to diminish stereotype threat and their experience of that? So let's start with the, your own reflection though first. So I want you to complete part one of the self-reflection that's in front of you. It's just got three items on what you believe about intelligence. So if anyone doesn't have a pen, we've got pens on the, on the table by the front. And so as you read each item, just put a box that indicates your level of agreement with each statement. And then I'll show you how to score it.
These, of course, are anonymous and confidential. Feel free to be honest. <laughs> no one's going to see it but you. I won't be collecting them later. <laughs> All right, so for scoring for this first one, it's pretty straightforward. Where whichever box you ticked, you will put the corresponding number. It goes from a, a one for strongly disagree all the way to five for strongly agree. And so whatever box you checked off, put the number there and then add up your three numbers and put the score there where it says score. Put your score there and see what your total is across the three. All right, so how many folks in the room were you, on average, across the three, uh, below a three? Anyone below a three? Okay. How many, how? Not below a three, sorry. So on average three. On average three, yes. How many on average were giving scores at about three or lower? About three or lower. Interesting. How many were more in the four and five range? Okay, any perfect fives? Very interesting. I did not, ex maybe I should have collected these. I did not expect to see that. Very interesting. So, for most of us here in this room, uh, we are, for the most part, saying that we don't really agree with these statements. We don't really agree with these statements. So what are these statements really represented of? Well, in theory of intelligence, the notion is that most people either believe that intelligence is malleable, it's expandable, it can increase, or they believe that it's fixed. Um, what we know from the research is if you believe that intelligence is malleable or expandable, that's very beneficial for you as a student. Right? So research has found that students who believe that they can increase their intelligence they identify with academics more strongly. They see it as a core part of their identity and have a stronger affinity for it. They enjoy education more. They, on average, have higher GPAs, higher test scores, and what I found in my research for our students of color, they experience lower stereotype threat perceptions. Right? So they're less likely to be impacted uh, by, by stereotypes when they believe that intelligence is malleable. For those who believe that intelligence is fixed, which sort of makes sense, they experience the opposite, right? Less identification with the academic domain, higher stereotype threat perceptions, and interestingly, greater learned helplessness. So these students are more likely to be those students that when they face difficulty in academics, they're just gonna shut down on you. How many educators in the room have had one of those students, right? I remember, uh, really the young girl that led me to my dissertation research, her name was Lorena, and I was tutoring her while, while I was undergrad at Stanford, and when we were reading, it was great. Lorena and I would read, and we'd talk about vocabulary, we had a great time together, and then I'd switch over to math, and she would shut down on me. It's like she became a different kid. She would become combative and, and obstinate, she wouldn't follow instructions, she literally shut down. But she had fallen into learned helplessness about math. Whatever her previous experiences were, she had convinced herself that she simply wasn't good at that and she was no longer going to try. And that's what we often see with young people who believe that intelligence is fixed. They're much more likely to fall into that unhealthy pattern where they're no longer willing to even engage in effort to try to get better at something. We also see, though, in, in my research for our students of color, that there's a relationship between how central race is for that student, right? How much that's a part of their identity, and then those fixed beliefs. So what I found was that when students have a, a central focus on who they are racially, they also were more likely to believe that intelligence is fixed. And when we think back to what I explained stereotype threat is, you can see the relationship there. Um, and how stereotype threat is probably really the trigger there that's leading to that relationship. All right, so most of us were more on the malleable side. I thought I'd see a little more diversity, but I mean, you all are here listening to a lecture on a weekday night, so that probably shouldn't have been so surprising. <laughs> 
Clearly, you have malleable intelligence beliefs. <laughs> All right, let's move to our next area, school culture, perceptions of the learning environment. So for this one, when we talk about culture, we've all heard the word, we know what it means. Uh, we know in particular within education, the school's culture means a lot of things, right? We're talking about norms and ways and attitudes, which is what we often hear when we talk about culture. But when you're talking about an institution, you also have to take into account the organizational structure take into account the administrative functioning, that's a part of the culture, take into account relationships and interactions, the physical space, the visual displays. And we've all felt this. How many of you have ever walked into some place, a school, an office building, a restaurant, and you just immediately felt unwelcome? Has anyone ever experienced that? There was just something about that place that the moment that you walked in the door, you were like, these people are not happy to see me. Or better yet, do these people see me, right? <laughs> because everyone ignore you and, and no one greeted you, right? We've all had that experience. And so when we talk about culture, we're talking about that as well. Just sort of the, sort of the psychological environment, all of those unspoken messages that happen when someone does or does not greet you or how they looked at you when they greeted you and all of those things. We're also talking about the teacher discourse, the practices, the goals, all of those things play into culture. Now, research has showed us that students pick up on those things in very keen ways. They are taking in everything. They're taking in what's on the walls. They're taking in whether or not this school bothers to keep itself clean for them. They're taking in the things that the teacher says and doesn't say. They're taking in the interactions that are happening between other students and the teacher and the teachers as they hear them in the hallway. They are, kids are much more perceptive than we often think and they're picking up on all those things. And research has shown us that that ultimately impacts their educational outcomes, what they perceive about the environment that they're in. Some great quotes that help to illustrate that. The academic structure of the organization and its underlying belief system about students' capabilities to learn shape students' academic experiences and their subsequent outcomes, right? So unspoken messages, are you capable? Students perceive classrooms as defining the purpose of learning in differing ways, and these perceptions influence the goals that students themselves adopt, thereby influencing their motivation and their learning. Instructional practices and teacher discourse convey implicit and explicit messages concerning students' moral, social, and intellectual capacity, the goals and purposes of learning, and the different reasons for engaging in academic activities. Students' interpretations of these messages, in turn, influence the quality of their academic and socio-emotional functioning. Right? So all of those elements play into culture and ultimately impact students. So I want you to take yourselves back in time to high school. For some of us, that was a really, really long time ago. Not for all of us, for some of us not so long, but for some of us that was a really, really long time ago. But as you complete part two of the self-reflection, I want you to take yourself back to high school. I chose high school because that's something we all have in common. And I want you to think about those questions in relation to high school. And again, like you did the last time, put a check in each box for how much you agree or disagree about each statement as you reflect on your high school experience. And then we'll score this one and see where we land. I'll put the scoring up for those who are ready. You want to take note that some of these you have to reverse code. So number three, five, seven, and nine, the numbers are actually in the reverse order.
And as you did before, you can tally up your numbers, put your score. All right, so how many of us, on average, were scoring ones and twos? Wait, you're not finished yet? Okay. Are we ready? Okay, how many of us on average were scoring about ones and twos? Okay. Anyone sort of in the middle, mostly neutral? Threes? How many of us more on the fours and fives? Higher scores, interesting, okay. So for this one, the higher your total score, the more what we would consider um, focused on mastery, you perceived your school to be right. Because this is all self-perception. This was your experience. We could take two students in the same high school and you could come up with uh, potentially completely different assessments of the school. Um, but for the higher your score is, then you felt like your school was more focused on mastery than they were focused on performance. And so that's this core area. This performance orientation is really when you're in an environment that again, per your perception, feels very hyper-focused on performance. Focus on grades, focus on test scores, focus on competition and comparison among students. All of the awards and accolades are based in how high you performed versus a mastery-oriented environment where the focus was more on, on effort, being your best self, doing your best, mastering content over time, uh, much more focused on how you have improved over time versus how you are comparing to other students would be a more mastery focused environment. I'm interested to hear for those who felt like your, your high school was a more mastery oriented environment, I'm interested in, to hear just what were some of those core experiences that stood out to you as a place that was more focused on effort and the mastery of content. Does anyone want to share? Flo? Cooperative, right? Cooperative learning. That's a great example. Yes, Stephanie. sort of a, a hybrid. You had a hybrid experience. <laughs> Anyone else want to share? Or on the flip side, if you feel like you were in a very performance-oriented environment, 
What was that, what was that like and what were some of the core elements of that experience? Yes, Shelley. It's a huge, big dichotomy between the two. Oh, we've got hands here. We'll go to Alana and then we'll take these two ladies here. That's a whole other performance pressure, right? <laughs> yes, right here. Oh, talk about put a sticker on my head, right? You're, you're, you're not going to the barbecue. We know what that means, right? But when we, when we talk about these experiences, right, and we could go deeper and we could talk about, well, how did that make you feel, right? And how that made you feel probably depends on whether or not you went to the barbecue or, or you were still left sitting in the classroom. But we, that's the part, right, that this, is, this research really focuses on is, okay, let's understand how that makes students feel when we're hyper-focused on performance and just the outcomes and what it leads our students to. Your example was, was a perfect example. There's a lot of talk about this right now in education, in particular in very high-performing suburban and private schools, this concern around what we call doing school. There's a great uh, book by Denise Pope, if you're interested and want to check it out, called Doing School, where she talks about this phenomenon right now within suburban schools and, and private schools of students just doing school. Not learning learning anything, right? Not mastering any content, but they're, they're figuring out how to get the best grades and how to get the test scores so they can get into the best college, but not focused on what should be this wonderful, joyous experience of learning new things, right? And expanding their knowledge base and figuring out what they like and what they're interested in. And so research has shown that when we are in these more mastery focused environments, that that's related again to being more highly identified with the academic domain. 
For our students of color, I found that it also was related to lower stereotype threat perceptions and also a greater belief that others view your race positively. So there were some interesting interactions there between students' perceptions of the school environment and then their perceptions of their own racial identity as well as stereotype threat perceptions. So again, the punchline being here, these mastery-focused environments have positive benefits for all students and then have this sort of additional benefit for our students of color where it sort of frees them up from those stereotype threat perceptions. And when we think back to what stereotype threat is, it makes sense, right? If stereotype threat is all about, I'm trying not to prove a stereotype that I'm not able, well, if you're in an environment that's highly focused on, are you able, we can understand why that would trigger those stereotype threat perceptions for a student. All right, let's keep this rolling. Next one is academic goal orientations, right? So this is really about when you're in the school environment, what is your goal, right? When you're sitting in the classroom as a student, what is your goal? What are you trying to achieve? Uh, so for this one, again, we're, we're, we're still back in time in high school, and you're thinking back to yourself as a high school student and thinking about, okay, what was sort of my primary focus or my goal when I was sitting in the classroom as a high school student? So complete part three of the self-reflection, same process, into your check marks, and then we'll score it and tally up your scores. Big difference here, as you'll see, there are sort of three different subsections, and I'll talk about each one of those. And when you're ready for the scoring, this one is uh, straight ones and one through five across the board for all of them. So after you've made your marks, you can tally up your score. And you see here you have three different sets of scores, the first one through seven, the second three, and then the final three. When you're ready, go ahead and put your pen down. That will be my, my indication. We're ready to move forward. So how many of us, let's look at this first seven. How many of you, on average, were, were checking off ones and twos? A few folks. Threes, sort of in the middle, more neutral. How many of us were in the fours and fives? Okay, a lot of us here. Right, so this, uh, this scale, or parts of the survey, that would be assessing how much a student's own goals were mastery goals, right? They were focused on learning for the sake of learning, and. Uh, mastering content, putting in effort. How about this second set, these three? How many of us were about ones and twos? Okay, threes. 
fours and fives. Okay, so if you were scoring higher on this scale, then that indicates that you had what we call an ego approach goal. That one of your goals was to demonstrate your intelligence. Right, and we'll talk more about that. And then this last three, how many of us were in the ones and twos? Threes? More fours and fives? Interesting, so this one, if you were higher, fours and fives, then you had um, what we call an ego avoidance goal, meaning you were looking to not demonstrate that you were unintelligent, right? <laughs> so ego avoidance, ego approach are sort of like two different sides of the same coin. So when we talk about these academic goal orientations, or what is the student's goal when they're in the classroom, uh, we have research uh, done by great folks like Carol Dweck and others that have categorized these. So ego approach, the desire to prove intelligence, right? This is that student for us educators who is always raising their hand. They want to contribute. They want to be actively involved. They go above and beyond on their assignments. Right? They are focused on excellence, doing well, and really demonstrating that they, I am capable and I am intelligent. Sort of the flip side of that coin, though, is the student with the ego avoidance goal. They desire to avoid seeming unable. Right? So this student is sometimes the student who is sitting in the back of the room, trying to sort of stay under the radar. They do not want to be called on. They might actually be very upset right, or combative if you call on them, in particular if they didn't feel prepared. Um, this is the student who's a bit more withdrawn when they're uh, in a group situation because, again, they don't want to put themselves out there. They're worried about saying the wrong thing, giving the wrong answer, or seeming like they're not able. You then have this work avoidance, um, which I didn't have you do an assessment of because it's an interesting one. So this, this one is the student who they want to demonstrate their ability, but they want to demonstrate it by always having easy tasks, right? So there's sort of a combination of the two, right? I want to demonstrate that I'm smart, but I don't want to work hard, right? So I want, I want you to give me easy things to do so I can demonstrate that I'm smart, right? So this is the student in a lot of ways that we might, you know, I'm going to keep it real here with educators. This is our student we often consider like our lazy students, like you're so much more, you're so much brighter. Than, than what you are putting forth here, right? So this student may often be capable, but they don't want to work, right? They don't want to work, they want to fly under the radar. And then mastery, of course, that's the student who is learning for the sake of learning. They want the challenge, they want the extra credit work. That's a student who's always asking you, is there something else I can do, right? I'm, I'm already done with that homework, can you give me more homework, <laughs> right? I'd, I'd really like to read more on this topic, I thought it was very interesting, right? This student who really is engaging in the content for the sake of the content. Now, the impact this, this has on students is not always straightforward. So ego approach is not necessarily a bad thing. If the student is high performing, then an ego approach goal can be very adaptive for them because the two match. I want to improve, to prove that I'm intelligent and I'm able to, right? So that works very well. If, however, I am struggling, I have a learning disability or I have some gaps in my skills because of previous educational experiences, then this becomes a very maladaptive goal. Because if I desire to prove my intelligence but I'm not able to, that's going to lead me to learn helplessness, frustration, and all of those things uh, because I have this goal that I simply can't meet. Mastery, of course, research has found is adaptive for all. Whether the student is currently at grade level or not, this is a good goal for them. Whether or not they're struggling or not, whether or not they have a learning disability or not, focusing on mastery, focusing on improvement over time, focusing on learn the content for the sake of the content is going to help to propel that student forward. Now, the ego avoidance is the one that I found interacted with race. So this goal was particularly unhelpful for our students of color. Because, as you can imagine, if my goal is to avoid seeming unable, that's triggering those stereotype threat perceptions, right? I don't want to confirm the stereotype. And so I found that students that had an ego avoidance goal orientation were also more likely to say that they experienced stereotype threat perceptions. So that one's particularly maladaptive for our students of color. So we want to push students toward a mastery orientation. 
focusing on the content, focusing on effort, focusing on being their best selves. And what we're gonna close out on tonight is really having some table discussion about, well, how do we do that, right? How do we create environments where we do that? All right, so our last big section is going to be on racial identity. So there is, as with all of these areas, decades of research on racial identity. And the research here is fairly conflictual. Overall, the prevailing theme is that, okay, racial identity can, does not always, but can serve as this protective um, sort of shield for students of color. But then there's some research that had found that it was maladaptive, right? That having a strong racial identity did not seem to be helpful for students of color. And so the, the, the um, particular set of research that I focused on, I felt helped to clarify some of the confusion. So it's a gentleman, Dr. Sellers, and he created a particular multidimensional theory of racial identity where he broke it down into different parts that I think helped to clarify why, why sometimes research found it to be helpful and sometimes research found it not to be. What he argued was, well, it's not one thing, right? It has different parts, and the different parts have different impacts. So he broke it down into these first three, racial centrality, private racial regard, and public racial regard. So centrality is, as the name hints, simply how central is that identity for the person, right? How important is it to them? When they think about who they are and all of their many selves, where is that on the list and is it top of the list for them? Private racial regard was how does that individual feel about themselves racially? When they think about being a Native American, do they feel positively about it, right? Do they embrace their own racial self and feel good about that identity? Public regard was then, how do you think other people think about your racial group? This last one that I added in, which you won't take tonight, was a um, concept that my advisor at the time was creating called racial identity content, which was really looking at well, what do you associate your race with? So this was an item where the students literally had a checkbox of probably 50 different things that they were just checking off. When I think of my racial group, I think my racial group is associated with these things, yes or no. And they were just checking things off. Um, so you won't take that one today. But I do want you to take this final part, part four of the reflection, where you will sort of look at your own racial identity, centrality, private regard and public regard. And what are your own thoughts today? So we're back to today. We got back in our time machine. We're back in 2016, no longer in high school. Today, right now, today, what are your thoughts um, and your level of agreement with each one of those statements? And then as you've done before, you'll tally them up and score them. And you'll notice up here, that for the private regard and the public regard, there are a couple of items that do have to be reverse coded. So take a look at those. So again, for the top portion, it's all one through fives. So that's why I didn't highlight that one for you. So for the top nine, it's all the usual one through fives for centrality. Then for the next seven, the private regard section, numbers four and seven have to be reverse coded. And then for the last section, the public regard section, the first three have to be reverse coded.
So again, as you're coding, the first nine for centrality are all coded one, low of one to a high of five. The second section on private regard, those seven need to reverse code numbers four and seven. And then the last section on public regard, reverse code numbers one, two, and three. Go ahead and put your pens down when you're ready. Are we ready? Are we ready? Okay. All right, let's look at centrality. How central is your racial identity to you? How many of us were in the ones and twos? About threes? Fours and fives? Okay. How about private regard? How you feel about your racial identity? How many of us were in the ones and twos? Threes, fours and fives. Okay, so a little bit of a spread. And then how about public regard? How many of us were more uh, initially, the numbers you saw, not here, initially in the ones and twos for public regard? Threes, fours and fives. Right, so a little, little bit more of a clear sort of racial dichotomy there around the public regard. So as we think about each one of these, of course, my whole goal here was to figure out how do we alleviate stereotype threat perceptions for students, right? How do we help our students of color to not face this unconscious psychological impact on their performance? And so this one was really key for me because, of course, one of my hypotheses was that Okay, well, a strong positive racial identity should provide some sort of protection for students and to, to help them not experience these stereotype threat perceptions. And for the most part, that's what I found. So I was looking at the relationship between racial identity and stereotype threat perceptions, found, as I hoped I would, that when students felt positively about their own, about themselves racially, they had lower stereotype threat perceptions. So the higher their private regard, uh, the lower their stereotype threat perceptions. Found that when students thought others thought of their racial selves positively, the higher their public regard, the lower their stereotype threat perceptions. And then this other construct that you didn't uh, try out tonight uh, around racial identity content, that the more students associated their race with positive, adaptive characteristics, the lower their stereotype threat perceptions as well, which makes sense on what I was hoping to find. What I also found that I did not expect to find, which was shocking to me, though after I thought about it more, it shouldn't have been, the more central race was for a student, the higher their stereotype threat perceptions. And so this was really important for me in the discussion of racial identity because often when we talk about racial identity, we're talking about centrality, right? We're thinking, right, we need to have multicultural days and we need to celebrate Black History Month and, you know, we need to celebrate this and celebrate that and we need to make sure that we have these moments where we focus on a student's racial self and celebrate them in, in some sort of external way. Well, what the research is telling us is that's not necessarily helpful. Right, you heightening my identity, my racial identity, is not necessarily what's going to be helpful. What is going to be helpful for students is that you regularly and consistently expose them to positive images 
of others like themselves. That's going to help them. That in your discourse, in your interactions, that you are communicating to them that you think highly of the racial group from which they come, that's going to help them. Not the sort of microburst of focus that we simply give uh, to, to cultural days and things of that sort. That's not necessarily the most adaptive thing for them, right? Because it's really just heightening the centrality of that particular element of themselves. So it's something for us to know and to keep in mind as educators. Um, and as we're getting ready to close out, our final discussion is really going to be, okay, what, do, what can we do with this information? What does this mean for us in the class Room in schools, and even for us who aren't educators, what does this mean in our jobs, right? Because these things don't stop in high school, right? These are not phenomenons of adolescence. These are psychological phenomenons of human beings. So even in your workplace, if in particular if you're a supervisor, you're working with a team, what does this look like? to have mastery-focused work environments, right? What does it look like to have places where people feel a sense of acceptance and belonging in the workplace as well? So let's, let's talk about those things, right? So the, the, the big aha from my research was, we knew research said these things were important for students. My research went on to confirm that and to identify ways in which these things are particularly important for students of color. But the big question for me now is how? And I will tell you right now, I don't have an answer to that question. I do not have an answer to that question, but that's the question I'm grappling with right now is, okay, this is great. We know we should build malleable beliefs about intelligence. That's gonna help our kids. We know that we should create mastery-focused academic environments. It's gonna be adaptive for them. We know that we should push students towards those mastery achievement goals and focus them in, not on the outcomes and the test scores and the getting into the Yales and all of those things. We should really try to focus them in on a love of learning, right? And, and learning for learning's sake, which is so contrary to where we are right now in education. And we know also that our students need identity safety. And we need to build a strong academic self-image for them. It's important for all students, particularly important for our students of color. But then how do we do that, right? And for those of us who are educators, we have to answer that question in the face of the reality, right? For any of us who have been in a classroom, you know, you I frankly might be rolling your eyes. It's like, what? You want me to do that too, right? How do, how do I do that too, right? How do I walk into my room of 25 to 30 students and in addition to the pacing guides and in addition to the new common core state standards that no one understands and in addition to having to do a recess duty and uh, you know, dealing with little Eddie who's having a temper tantrum in the corner, you want me to you know, stroke their psychological selves as well? Like how do I do that? Right, so getting to the tangible, how do you do that, I will be honest, I don't have an answer yet. So I want you guys to talk about it. I want us to talk about it and to think about it. When we think about these areas, these sort of psychological benefits that students need, what does that mean in a classroom or in a school? What does that mean for structures, processes, policies, practices, activities? How would we actually do this? And if you're an educator, I definitely want you to think about that from the perspective of the classroom. If you are a parent, I want you to think about that from the perspective of what you think would be helpful for your child. And even if none of those things apply to you, we have all been students. So I want you to think about what it would have meant for you and what it would have looked like for you to have been in a classroom that emphasized in those areas. And what do you think? are some of the, er the er elements that could have been incorporated that would have helped push you more towards a malleable intelligence belief or a mastery goal orientation. So I'm gonna come around to each one of the tables and give you one of these areas. Beliefs about intelligence, school culture, academic goal orientations, or racial identity. And we're not gonna take long because we're running low on time. We're just gonna take maybe five minutes and really think about what might it look like tangibly to create these kind of environments? And then we'll have some time to share out before we end our time tonight. Make sense? Sound good? Are you guys ready? I'm looking for groundbreaking ideas here.
So ladies and gents, as you're wrapping up your conversations, be sure to identify a spokesperson at your table who can share out a brief summary of your discussion, which we will do in about 30 seconds. All right, everyone. I know these conversations are going on. I'm excited to see everyone is engaged in discussing these concepts. Do want to be respectful of everyone's time, though, and we've got 10 minutes left. So we want to pop around to each table and just get a brief synopsis of uh, which area you were looking at and what were some of the ideas that you came up with. We will start over here, Shelly, with your table. Yes, I will give you the mic so we can get it on the... Hi, we were talking, whoa, that's loud. We were talking about um, the theory of intelligence, perceptions of their own intelligence, and my mind immediately went to a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset, um, not just in raw intelligence of the person, but do they, um, and that can apply to a teaching staff as well as a classroom of students. Um, so to help students who have a fixed mindset, you, uh, we identified ways to scaffold learning, or to identify their current strengths and how can we build on that and get them to the next level of success and celebrate that success wherever they're at. Not that y'all have to come in and be rock stars, but where, where you are at, we're gonna celebrate the growth at the next level. Wonderful, awesome. Do we have another group that also had theory of intelligence? We'll stay on that topic before we move. We also had theory of intelligence and we were focusing on looking at grades or not and we were saying that you should focus away from having the students looking at just their grades and to look at the goal of them improving and to see the potential in each student, their unique potential and to focus on the growth that each student makes. So that might seem far-fetched, but I was telling Pam, I actually went to such a high school. So my high school, the Urban School of San Francisco, we did not get grades. Um, and initially I was quite traumatized because I, I am an ego approach type A student and I was having a meltdown my first semester in high school because I was like, I need to know if I'm doing well. Um, so I actually had a teacher who had to pull me aside and show me my grades and pat me on the back while I was rocking and tell me to calm down. But over the four years, I was telling Pam, I saw how that changed me as a student. So they were recording grades on a transcript for us, of course, because we had to get into college. But at the end, we were on a block schedule, and at the end of each quarter, you sat down with each teacher individually, and you had a conference. And they talked to you about your strengths. They talked to you about your areas of improvement. You came up with a plan of action for the next quarter, and you did not get a grade. So when you took a test in class, we took tests, but we didn't get grades on them. We did different assignments, we got feedback, but we didn't get grades on them. And then at the end of every school year, they sent us our GPA in the mail. But throughout the school year, the focus was always on constructive feedback, areas of strength, areas of improvement, and setting goals for constant improvement. But what that did for me as a student is, it motivated me to always do my very best because you're not trying to get the carrot anymore, you're trying to get your, your, you know, your best self out there. And then I saw myself go to college and completely revert. So it was very, very interesting to see the power that that environment had and I really saw, saw the way that it impacted me. All right, I'm over here, so let's go to this group. Which one did you guys have? 
Um, we were talking about mastery versus performance-based, and we kind of came to the conclusion that it would be better to start in the classroom rather than looking at schools from the whole, and instead of changing how a community identifies a school, um, focusing on the inside of the classroom and getting away from those, um, the idea of students trying to learn something for a test and instead getting towards project-based learning, um, so then that way students aren't memorizing, 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 and then forgetting, 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 but instead they are putting together projects, they are working on something, doing research of their own, um, and then that way they are getting away from that performance base and instead getting towards mastery um, just through performing, or just through uh, doing those projects instead of testing. That's a great example, and for those who are going to be future teachers, if that's of interest to you, the example that Flo gave about an international baccalaureate school, they're big, they're big on the project-based learning, the inquiries, so something to think about. Did any other group have the school culture? All right. Okay. So we had school culture as well, and um, we focused a lot more on the reward system, I think, so. Previously, another table also focused on that. And we were trying to figure out, OK, what's a way that we can actually have students focusing on mastery of the subject instead of just you know, getting an A or getting the right answer? Um, and we came up with a lot of different things. There's this concept called design thinking. And uh, the whole premise behind it is you fail fast until you get to an outcome. And along the way, you're learning why you're failing. And rewarding people for failing and understanding why they failed could be a much more interesting approach than rewarding them for just getting the right answer the first time. Um, along those lines, doing things like reflecting back and, and um, grading based on the knowledge of what went wrong. So I was shocked to find out that people actually went to a classroom where um, if you had a science project and something went wrong, you know, you could get full credit as long as you could describe what, what it was or why it went wrong. So and for me, it was, uh, you got an F, now get the hell out of here. But, um, and then we also talked a little bit about strengths, a strengths-based environment, this whole concept of strengths finders and focusing on what you're good at to get to that level of mastery instead of focusing on the negative things that maybe you're not as good at. Right. This concept within education is not used probably as much as it should be, but this whole notion of that a wrong answer is learning, right? Let's talk about how you got there, right? Let's deconstruct your thinking there. And even small things, right? A student gets two right out of 20. We'll put a plus two instead of a minus 18. Right? Doesn't that just feel, it feels a little better, right? It feels a little, right? Those small things that we could do. Did um, anyone else have, well, we did the two, two school cultures. We have two tables left. Oh, you guys had the academic goal orientation. We don't really have a spokesperson. Um, neither of us are educators. Uh, I work in mental health with children and families, and she works with adults with disabilities. So we were really looking at it as focusing on the, uh, using the right language here, the mastery, so that they will have that self-confidence to move on, especially and to move on to a job like where she's working with the adults. Um, also supporting them as far as the students of color and supporting them with not just having pictures of like, you know, the football players, but people who've actually made a difference in, um, in, la in people's lives from that race. So trying to make it feel like they're more comfortable and then also looking at even the special education classrooms of someone who is showing that they are able and of color and they are able to maybe have some confidence and motivation that they're also able to do that as well. But really focusing on them building their self-confidence first. Thank you, thank you, and that's an important one. There was a lot more in my research than I was able to cover, but one of those things was academic self-confidence. And if we went into the whole study, there were a lot of interactions with academic self-confidence and all of these concepts, including racial identity. All right, last but not least. John, are you, Tim? Educators. <laughs> um, we had perceptions of how, uh, how they're perceived 
racial identity intersects with each of these social psychological factors impacting student outcomes. And um, so we, we, we talked about a lot, of, a lot of things. Some of them were kind of targets at, well, our resources in and as far as that we use would be diverse in, in their, where they were the source. Um, it, uh, it's a subtle piece, but it's an important piece because that's sort of a foundational piece for your, the subject area or discipline that you're, you're in. Um, that the representative uh, speakers, that again, those are people invited into, the, into your class and given special permission to be able to speak into your class and having co being cognizant of you know, who they are and that they do represent diversity. Um, then we kind of started talking a little bit about, I think, what I would classify as culture in the classroom, that there's expected participation and yet opportunity to share, and that that's part of the class and not a uniqueness to any specific perceived skill set or finish line that someone maybe has, has reached and they become the authority in, in answering. Um, that growth is a part of what is, is part of the culture. It's not about where you are, it's where your next step is. And um, then um, we talked a bit about that idea of safety, going back to Maslow, and uh, that um, idea of social, emotional, physical, academic, intellectual safety to be able, and being a part of the culture of the, of the classroom that, um, and, and we then got stuck a bit about content in that, well, sometimes you have to get to a certain point, but is it counterproductive if, if you are you know, leaving some folks in the wake because of not taking the time to continue to create and nurture that side of um, safety? Is, was there anything else? Right, that's a big one, right? And teachers struggle with that a lot, right? We feel this pressure to get through the content and get through the curriculum. Um, but I would say, I know I experienced it myself, I'm sure other teachers would say it, and the research supports it. The time you spend building relationship, the time you spend making sure that your students feel comfortable and they feel safe in the environment, those moments that you take, right, if it's the, the, you know, I know some schools, they take the whole first week of school and the whole first week of school is just about culture and identity, all right, and coming together as a community, but that time will pay you back, right, it will pay you back um, over and over again as you're then trying to get into content over the course of the year. We're definitely running out of time, out of time, and so I, I really like to close here because certainly, uh, not just because we're at a faith-based institution, but you know, being a woman of faith, this work for me is really birthed out of this desire to see people whole, right? It's really birthed out of this desire for this one institution that every child will touch at some point in their lives and thinking about the magnitude of potential that exists there, this one place, that every child in the country is going to touch at some point. And in a sense, it feels like this one opportunity, right? That we've got this chance to touch every child's heart and every child's mind if we can get this right in education and if we can really focus on enveloping them with love and communicating to them acceptance and belonging and ability and really validating who they are as a person. So I'd like to close out with this very short few seconds clip from Brene Brown. How many of us are familiar with Dr. Brene Brown? If you have not heard of her, I definitely encourage you to check her out. Um, she's just got some great content. And this is a brief piece, really uh, literally a few seconds, from a TED Talk of hers. And we'll really close it out here. All of the interviews where I saw worthiness, where I saw people living that way, and just looked at them, I took the people I interviewed and divided them into people who really have a sense of worthiness. That's what this comes down to, a sense of worthiness. They have a strong sense of love and belonging. And folks who struggle for it, and folks who are always wondering if they're good enough, 
there was only one variable that separated the people who have a strong sense of love and belonging and the people who really struggle for it, and that was the people who have a strong sense of love and belonging believe they're worthy of love and belonging. That's it. So the, the task at hand is really, how do we do that in the classroom, right? How do we instill in every student this clear sense that they are worthy of love and belonging and give them that infusion, as Tessa talked about, that can then carry them on throughout their academic career and into adulthood. I thank you for your time and your participation um, and your great ideas. And certainly, if you're interested in learning more, feel free to email me. I'm happy to send you my very long dissertation if you'd like to read it. Uh, and get more into the content um, and to have any future discussions. So thank you. Thank you again. I so appreciate what you, what you shared with us. And part of the lecture series is the idea of taking research and putting it to practice. You know, where does the rubber meet the road? And then that is the challenge that you put before us, is what do we do with that? And how do we make a difference? And I think the thing that is exciting about being in room with, with educators, and, and I think those that, that, that work and continue to improve students uh, or their, I don't know if you'd call clients' lives, is about that's that being a teacher. It's just not that, maybe that same level. Maybe we call it trainer, maybe we call it not level, but same, same definition that we sometimes think of a traditional teacher being standing in front of a classroom. I think anybody who's impacting students' lives or their own children's lives or their lives of those that they come in contact with are teachers, parents are teachers, those that are working in our, in many of our agencies are teachers, and um, I, I believe, yes, even administrators are, should be teachers, and, um, and so I think you've challenged all of us to look at things differently, and, um, or at least take a look at what we are doing, and uh, appreciate that. Thank you again, Aisha.